Chapter 33, The Fall and Rise of the I-35W Mississippi River Bridge. Starting date, Wednesday, August 1st, 2007, at 6 hours 5 minutes and 38 seconds p.m. Metro 50 cars got a report of uh, some, some sort of collapse in the construction zone north of University. Four thirty seven. And five five one, I'll be ten eight down here. She's out of the way in a triple in row. And two twenty four. Metro, West Metro is going to be 1033 at this time. All cars, 50 cars, we have a bridge collapse. The river bridge over the Mississippi River Bridge is down. Twenty-five hundred Metro. 80 Metro, 60 cars being rolled off. Tepper, we'll need uh, southbound close and northbound. Both sides are down. 2500, you copy? Route 169 and Highway 7. Temper 1806. Ending date, Wednesday, August 1st, 2007, at 6 hours 6 minutes and 53 seconds p.m. Thirty-three point one. After spending ten months on sabbatical in London studying the co-evolution of transport and land use, on Tuesday, July thirty-first, two thousand seven, my family and I returned home to Minneapolis. We had many things to do to restart a household, among them shopping. Relatives were in town for a conference, and they had rented a minivan. The next day, we went to a warehouse club, Costco, to pick up basic stores, filling the back of our vehicle with typical American middle-class goods: paper towels, diapers, etc. While we traveled to the store on what any online mapping service would suggest is the shortest path, on the return at about 3 p.m., we took West River Parkway instead of the highway to avoid traffic and have a more scenic view. That route runs along the Mississippi River and passes immediately below the I-35W bridge. I did not look up at the bridge from below as we drove under it. At 6.05 p.m., Central Daylight Time, August 1, 2007, the I-35W Mississippi River Bridge famously collapsed. By 6.10, I and the world knew about the collapse from watching both local news and CNN. People from around the world contacted me wishing well. I didn't know any of the 13 dead or 145 injured at the time, and was surprised as anyone at the collapse, having driven under and on the bridge many times. We discovered that it was an eight-lane truss arch bridge that had opened in 1967 and carried about 140,000 vehicles a day. Everyone in the greater Minneapolis-St. Paul region had their own story, some heroic, most mundane. Everyone, though, remembers it. The Regional Traffic Management Center, RTMC, in Roseville, Minnesota, received news instantly and had video cameras in the area, which they quickly pointed in the direction where once stood the bridge. The recording of their audio inputs are transcribed in the opening quote. In the stream of random and mundane information coming into the center, communications were received about the collapse. The next morning, August 2, 2007, 8.24 a.m., Paul Levy of the local Star Tribune newspaper reported an article with the headline, one which varied across the day and the week. Four dead, 79 injured, 20 missing after dozens of vehicles plummeted into river. As with any tragedy, information as of August 2nd was incomplete. People were missing, some of whom were found alive, others dead. The estimates of injured went up as better counts were made. In the days following, I received some 17 media contacts asking about the traffic effects. My structural engineering colleagues received many, many more. As researchers, my transportation colleagues and I quickly proposed studies to examine the consequences of the collapse. Users take infrastructure for granted. From the roots, infra meaning below or underneath, and structure meaning building or assemblage, 
Infrastructure is, by its very nature, not obvious and is often hidden in plain sight. Yet, its absence is noticed. Americans seldom complain about lack of on-demand electricity, blackouts, natural gas, or water, but often complain about lack of on-demand transportation capacity, which we call congestion. When construction or events close routes so you cannot get from here to there, the complaints rise. But when infrastructure fails unexpectedly, it engenders shock rather than complaint. Why did the bridge collapse? And what does it say about the state of infrastructure in the United States, and for that matter, the developed world? In a one-time event, blame is a useless exercise. My blaming you will not produce better future outcomes. But in a world with signals and repeated games, blame can lead people to behave better in the future, and the prospect of being blamed for failure may encourage behavior to avoid failure. Too much blame for failure and insufficient reward for success will lead to risk-averse outcomes. In some arenas, conventional finance, structural engineering, risk aversion is probably a good idea. They provide a lattice on which the rest of society depends to accomplish their own work. The gains from innovation are likely small, the loss is higher. In other areas, for example, war, risk aversion on the part of the weaker army may ensure defeat. To answer the question of why the bridge collapsed, one can look to physics and blame gravity, one can look to structural engineering and blame undersized gusset plates, or one can look to construction engineering practices and blame overloading. Or one can look to traffic engineering and blame the need for all those people to get from A to B. Or one can look to politics and ask why the bridge, which had different known problems, had not already been repaired, and so on. The layers of blame are worth exploring. The collapse of the bridge illustrates several different kinds of networks in action. The bridge itself was a structural network, a connection of steel and concrete elements designed, but in the end failing, to transmit force safely from the bridge deck to the ground. The bridge was a link in the transportation network, an element of the limited access U.S. interstate highway system, enabling people to travel by car from point to point without stopping. The news of the collapse of the bridge was transmitted over communications networks, both electronic and social. It was a quickly transmitted piece of information. 33.2. Structure Bridges are designed to overcome gravity. They take travelers over a trench, river, or chasm of some kind to reduce the cost of travel. In their absence, travelers would need to descend and ford a river, take a ferry, or make some other less convenient accommodation. Bridges are networks, sometimes simple, sometimes complex, for transmitting force from the air to the ground. These networks may be of stone, concrete, wood, steel, or other materials. The network elements are connected in various ways. The I-35W bridge was constructed as part of the interstate highway system. It was not the first crossing of the Mississippi River in the city of Minneapolis. One can see many other crossings from the photos and maps. Immediately upstream, we find the oldest extant crossing, the curved Stone Arch Bridge, dating from 1883, which originally brought trains of the Great Northern Railway across the St. Anthony Falls from Old St. Anthony on the east bank of the river to the Mill District on the west, and now acts as a pedestrian crossing. Immediately downstream is the 10th Avenue Bridge, opened in 1929 and still carrying vehicles. The first river crossing in Minneapolis was the 1855 Hennepin Avenue Bridge, a tolled suspension bridge, which lasted at least 20 years. In principle, engineers know, or knew, how to build long-lasting structures. That with proper maintenance could last centuries. In fact, the Pons Fabricius in Rome was originally constructed in 62 BCE, more than 2,000 years ago, and has remained in continuous use. So something went wrong on I-35W for it to only last 40 years, and something has gone wrong in civil engineering practice if we are designing bridges to only last 50 years. The National Transportation Safety Board, the federal government agency for investigating failures, engaged in an extensive one-year study of the collapse. Inadequately sized gusset plates, sheets of steel that connect truss members, beams, girders, and columns, and bridges and other structures, were the proximate cause. While the gusset plates were too thin for the design, they were not so thin that the bridge collapsed earlier. The bridge was undergoing some construction at the time of the collapse. Only two of the four lanes were open to traffic, while the others were being resurfaced. It was the combination of the undersized gusset plates with increased weight of the bridge over time, due to things like pavement resurfacings, and, in particular, the loading of construction materials on the bridge above the gusset plate that day that was the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. Once one gusset plate cracked and could not support the loads, cascading failures led to the collapse. The bridge was fracture critical or non-load path redundant, meaning that once one critical element failed, there was no redundant element to take the load. 
Tom Fisher says that fracture critical design has four characteristics, lack of redundancy, interconnectedness, efficiency, and sensitivity to stress. Beyond that, it has long been known that the bridge was structurally deficient, and it had been investigated for other possible failure modes. A report by my late colleague Bob Dexter is interesting in that it said, As a result, MnDOT does not need to prematurely replace this bridge because of fatigue cracking, avoiding the high costs associated with such a large project. The report was correct as far as it went, since fatigue cracking was not the source of failure. It did not identify the problems with the gusset plates, nor did any inspections after construction. The United States still has about 18,000 fracture-critical bridges. Some 465 have similar designs to the I-35W bridge. There are about 72,500 structurally deficient bridges, according to the United States Department of Transportation, out of about 600,000 bridges. Another 80,000 are functionally obsolete, which does not imply a bridge safety problem, but means they are not to standard, for instance, with narrow lanes or under capacity for demand. Bridge failures on the interstate are not as uncommon as one might think. Table 33.1 shows significant interstate bridge failures and their causes. Other bridges have been closed before failure and repaired or replaced. The Sherman-Minton Bridge across the Ohio River was closed in 2011 after cracks were discovered and repaired. While some causes seem to be acts of nature, earthquakes are difficult to predict, barge collision, truck explosion, good design will defend against even those failures, at least to a point. The trade-off inherent in all design is the amount of failure to be accepted. Will we accept one interstate bridge failure in the United States every day? No. Every month? No. Every year? No. Every decade? Yes. Every century? Yes. Nine failures in 27 years indicates about one every three years is somehow acceptable. Each higher standard is increasingly expensive. At some point, money spent on reducing fatalities by making ever safer bridges outweighs the same money spent on reducing deaths some other way. For example, increasing traffic safety or reducing air pollution. For instance, a billion dollars annually spent on reducing expected fatalities from bridge collapses by one person per year is 200 times more than would be spent reducing traffic fatalities, where the statistical value of life is on the order of 5 to $6 million per person, and would be a misallocation of resources from a safety perspective. We can, of course, potentially add the costs of infrastructure replacement avoided, but we certainly spend more per life saved on safety in structures than on safety in traffic. As with aviation crashes, bridge collapses are highly visible and are perceived as more common than they really are. 33.3. Communication. The I-35W bridge collapse occurred before the advent of Twitter when there were only 50 million users of Facebook. As of July 2013, there were over 1.1 billion users and growth in the user number seems to be leveling off. I joined Facebook on November 13, 2004, so they tell me, when Facebook had fewer than 1 million users. But it was pretty much useless to me until late 2008, when enough people I knew were on it to make it interesting to check in. And though I added 24 friends in 2007, I never posted. It did not even occur to me to update my Facebook status, which would likely be the first place many Twin Cityans would go today in such an event. I did update my blog the next day. Yet the news traveled fast. TV, radio, on-road variable message signs, phone calls, and emails all helped transmit this knowledge. We have evidence on how the news traveled by looking at traffic counts. Figure 33.1 shows the difference in counts between August 1st and a week earlier, July 25th, which are otherwise similar days. As noted, behavior changed quickly that night. Traffic counts were lower system-wide, but especially upstream and downstream of the collapse. In contrast, the best long-distance alternatives, Minnesota 100 and I-35 East, saw upticks in traffic. 33.4. Politics Some will say the bridge collapse was not about money. Throwing money at the bridge would not have kept it from falling. Others note money could have bought more inspections, a structural finite element model of the bridge, better, faster repairs, the ability to replace the bridge sooner. Money could have been spent more wisely. More important, money is always a constraint on decision making at MnDOT. As was noted in the Star Tribune, phone call puts break on bridge repair. Plans to reinforce the bridge were well underway when the project came to a screeching halt in January amid concerns about safety and cost. Governor Tim Pawlenty had already vetoed a legislature-passed increase in the gas tax that could have raised money to repair bridges like this one. The latest vetoed gas tax would not have solved this problem, but previous taxes that were not passed, due in part to Polenti's previous veto threat, may have, had the money been spent on this kind of thing. The gas tax had not been raised in Minnesota since 1988, and thus its purchasing power had diminished significantly. While the network was expanded and aged, and traffic levels increased. 
Pawlenty's campaign took pride in this veto, posting a clipping from the Star Tribune on its website. Wednesday, May 16, 2007, Star Tribune. Pawlenty vetoes gas tax income tax bills. By Patricia Lopez, Star Tribune. Governor Tim Pawlenty struck swiftly and with strong language Tuesday to veto a gasoline tax increase and an income tax for property tax swap that were at the heart of the DFL's agenda for the session. DFLers accused him of protecting the state's richest 1%, those who would have borne most of the income tax increase, which would pay for the proposed property tax relief, at the expense of everyone else. But they conceded that some of their top objectives are fast sliding out of reach. Gas taxes in the United States and Minnesota are dedicated to transportation, and in some cases just to roads. The 2008 Minnesota gas tax bill phased in an increase of the gas tax by 8.5 cents a gallon by 2014. Of that, 3.5 cents of the gas tax increase was dedicated to paying debt service on $2 billion in road and bridge bonds. The bill borrowed $1 billion in 2009 and 2010, with $600 million earmarked for repairing or replacing the state's 13 most dangerous bridges. In addition, the bill increased the sales tax in the seven-county metro area by 0.25% for transit. It also increased license tab fees on newly purchased cars and trucks, 1.25% on sale of new cars, and drops 10% per year. The bill was passed by the legislature but vetoed by Governor Tim Pawlenty. The governor had run on a new, no new taxes pledge and clearly had political aspirations. He was frequently mentioned as a possible vice presidential running mate for the 2008 GOP presidential nominee, John McCain, and was hosting the GOP convention in St. Paul, Minnesota, that year. In the event, the governor of Alaska, who had more foreign policy experience, got the nod as the VP candidate. Pawlenty continued to look toward higher office and was for a time a candidate in the 2012 GOP nominating process before dropping out for lack of support and will. The override six are Republicans who voted with the DFL to override Governor Pawlenty's veto of the gas tax bill. Four of them lost their seats due to primary challenges, while the Republicans lost two of those seats, the DFL, in the 2008 general election. This leads to the rule that voting in favor of gas tax increases can be dangerous to your political health if you are a Republican. Carol Molnow was the state's lieutenant governor and MnDOT commissioner. While she had been confirmed in the first Pawlenty administration when she was reappointed, the DFL legislature did not confirm her, and her appointment expired in February 2008. That can be directly tied with dissatisfaction with her and the governor's performance dealing with the bridge. Notably, she was not the department's point person with the media in, that, in days, weeks, and months following the collapse. She was replaced by Tom Sorrell, a federal civil servant who had worked on the bridge replacement process. The political problem is deeper than just the fate of a few politicians, though. It is a classic problem in transportation funding. Ribbon cuttings on new projects are much more attractive to politicians in newspapers and TV news than maintaining what we have. People are also more interested in road surface than the underlying structure. Yet pavement failure, while bad, is not nearly as bad as structural failure. Failure in the traffic level of service sense, level of service F, while economically costly and personally annoying, and perhaps leading to more or at least different crashes, does not have anywhere near the same connotation as structural collapse. The competing uses of funds are ultimately political decisions. Should money be spent for bread and circuses, for example, football and baseball stadiums, rather than genuinely productive infrastructure? Five years later, should money be spent on new bridges with added capacity, for example, the St. Croix River crossing in Stillwater, while over 1,000 structurally deficient bridges remain in Minnesota? 33.5 Economic Effects At the request of MnDOT shortly after the collapse, we estimated the Twin Cities seven-county region daily vehicle hours of travel with and without the bridge using a planning model under two assumptions. The first kept the trip table fixed. This means that people did not change the number of trips or destinations in response to the bridge failure. This should give an upper bound to the effects of the bridge failure. The second allowed trip destinations to vary, though keeping the number of trips fixed. This provides more of a lower bound to the effects. Clearly, some people can switch destinations or avoid trips altogether if the cost of their previous destinations are now too high. On the other hand, not everyone can do so. The exact number of people who change destinations is not something we can easily know. Note, these are direct model outputs. So while the precision is high, the accuracy is not nearly as high as implied by the precision. We monetize these numbers using values of time from MnDOT of auto of $12.63 per hour and of truck of $20.41 per hour, and we assumed 80% auto and 20% truck, giving a composite value of time of $14.19. I believe the MnDOT value of time for trucks is very low. Our estimates put the number closer to $50 per hour. If we use that, we would get a composite value of time of $20.14. 
The results in Table 33.4 are, of course, estimates. However, the number is large and positive, which we expect, and the numbers lead us to conclude that letting bridges fall down is bad public policy, which most of us already knew. The number does have uses aside from rhetorically beating people over the head. It tells us, for instance, how much we should reward contractors for early completion. The problem is that those who benefit from the bridge or lose from the absence of the bridge differ from those who pay for it and are responsible for maintaining it. If presented with the choice of paying and keeping the bridge up and not paying and letting it fall, most users would gladly pay more than was required to keep the bridge up. We concluded a more thorough analysis later, Table 33.5, considering upgrades to alternative routes such as restriping I-94 to Adelaine and upgrading Minnesota 280 with somewhat lower results. 33.6 Traffic Travel behavior changes after the network disruption as well as after the replacement of disrupted links are not well understood. Table 33.6 shows the number of river crossing trips by type of facility before and after the collapse and reopening. We discovered 46,000 lost trips daily after the collapse, nearly a third of what the I-35W bridge had carried, and 20,000 found trips after the new bridge reopened. Those lost trips may not have been made, or more likely found different destinations not requiring a river crossing. This provides additional evidence to the phenomenon of induced demand. Gains from the bridge for three peak periods re-estimated with accurate, observed travel times, but a fixed and not observed OD matrix, shown in Table 33.7, were on the order of $70,000 per day somewhat below our initial low all-day estimates, $127,000, far below MnDOT's and also below the contractor's early completion bonus. Much of that gain is lost once the I-94 bridge lane disappears. As consistent with the original results, $42,000 annualizes to about $15 million in benefit for a $250 million bridge, which pays off in about 23 years at 3% interest. The I-94 lane restriping paid off in a matter of a month. 33.7 New bridge. The replacement bridge cost $251 million, funded almost entirely by the federal government. We can debate whether the federal government should have paid for it. It was originally built with 90% federal contributions, 10% state, but matches recently are much more balanced, since most of the traffic using the bridge both originated in and is destined for Minnesota. With Minnesota Congressman James Oberstar, then chair of the House Transportation Committee, there was plenty of political support behind this. The replacement bridge was hurried completed by September 2008, several months ahead of the original schedule. This is good, a lack of a bridge cost the economy. She and Levinson estimated between $127,000 and $170,000 per day. MnDOT estimated $400,000 per day. The contractor received $200,000 per day bonus for early completion. So perhaps in an economic sense, too much was paid to complete it a few months early. Rebuilding a collapsed bridge is of course a crisis, but it is also an opportunity to do something interesting. Rushing designs may mean that ideas are missed. What was built is a functional bridge, and there are state-of-the-art real-time structural health monitoring systems installed, so I have no fear of driving over it. It was also ensured that the bridge would be compatible with any future light rail transit lines, though none is planned for this bridge, and how they would transition from the center of the bridge to any reasonable destination is extremely unclear. But could more have been done? The snow removal and icing problem was not deeply considered. Minnesota is famous for its winters. The previous I-35W bridge had installed a de-icing system in response to earlier crashes, which had been speculated to be responsible for corrosion of the structure. While the NTSB did not find that, de-icing chemicals do have environmental consequences. A solution not considered was air rights. A bridge over the Mississippi is expensive, but imagine having a two- or three-story office building hanging from below and or built above the highway. The views from the river are fantastic. It would not impair other views of the river especially much, and would generate a significant amount of revenue to pay for reconstruction. One example would be the historic London Bridge, which had houses and stores along the side encroaching on travelways. Obviously, it would increase the initial construction cost and perhaps time, but that would be amply repaid over the long run. That structure would further have shielded the roadway from ice and snow, reducing road snow clearance costs and crashes. There are better ways to combine transportation arteries with development opportunities, and creative design can show the way. The bridge opened in the early darkness of September 18, 2008, a parade of first responders and then a bulge of traffic, all hoping to be the first, and none succeeding, went across. Soon the bridge was attracting 120,000 vehicles per day, measurably off the pre-collapse levels. 33.8 Policy Implications Unlike bridges, transportation networks are seldom fracture critical. While the interstate highway system did what it could to sever local street and channelized traffic flow onto fewer, larger, limited access links to achieve economies of scale, 
and higher speeds and throughputs at the expense of redundancy. There was enough remaining redundancy to ensure that this one bridge collapse would not have devastating transportation implications. Had the I-94 bridge collapsed instead, I am sure the consequences would have been much worse, as alternative paths are not as convenient. But again, the Twin Cities would have muddled through. Several lessons can be drawn. If there is redundancy, maintaining road operations during construction may not be necessary and may needlessly delay construction while exploding its cost. There have been projects in Minnesota, notably Minnesota 36, where closing the road entirely in order to speed construction has been successful. Rebuilding a bridge while keeping it open is like doing brain surgery on oneself. In principle, it is possible, but why? The length of bridge construction in other examples versus the less than one year from design to opening that this bridge took is instructive. Actual effects were much less than forecast. People are quite adaptable in their travel patterns, especially if there are alternative routes and destinations. As a consequence of the bridge collapse, many other bridges were repaired more quickly than they otherwise would have been. The list of recent bridge closures in the region below is illustrative. We see three successes. Emergency response, immediate traffic restoration, quick completion of bridge with design build. And we see three failures. Bridge collapse, removal of successful low-cost restoration measures, overpaying for the bridge. Overall, Americans seem good at short-term tactics but poor at longer-term strategy. This needs to be rectified. While there were positive outcomes, including the passage of the gas tax and increased attention to maintenance, there may have been some overreaction in terms of replacement of bridges. While there was some accountability, some key personnel remained in place. Firings and resignations need to be used more often in the aftermath of events like this. Some people should assume responsibility. We need to address the question of the appropriate role of politics in infrastructure decisions. We don't expect politicians to make recommendations about which electric power cables are replaced. Why are they so involved in maintaining existing roads? The construction of new roads is, on the other hand, more obviously political in nature. Should MnDOT and other similar agencies move toward a public utility model to depoliticize? We are not good at dealing with low-probability, high-consequence decisions. We are not good at assessing the value of either. Unless something is done, failure will be more frequent. The interstate system is aging and nearing the end of its useful life for many components. In the transportation experience, we identify a set of strategies for maturity. Abandonment, cash cow, using resources for something else, maintenance and rehabilitation, replacement. Abandonment of the interstate system as a whole seems premature, and while a handful of selected urban links have been closed, these are very much the exception. The cash cow strategy is in fact what has been employed for the past several decades, as the gains from the built infrastructure exceeded by far the amount that was reinvested in it. This is, of course, economically correct. Infrastructure should be fully exploited to its capacity, but this needs to be coupled with appropriate levels of maintenance and rehabilitation, and ultimately planned replacement. Otherwise, to mix our farm metaphors, the goose that lays the golden egg will die. The weak bridge sign that one sees all over England is not terribly reassuring, and indicates an unwillingness to recapitalize the network. In the U.S. context, there should be more money for transportation maintenance and rehabilitation. We are eroding our physical capital. If there isn't, we should spend our money more carefully, taking care of the existing systems and users first, and engaging in graceful abandonments as necessary, but not building new infrastructure that will require long-term maintenance without any means for doing so. The mantra, fix it first, has been suggested for this strategy, and I agree. Unless something is done, the problem of decaying infrastructure will only get worse, the physical world being subject to entropy and all. Bridges do not repair themselves.